Welcome, Julia. Hey, I'm so excited to be with you guys today, this morning. Well, we're, we're excited because uh, several of us have seen a version of this talk uh, over the past year or so. And uh, I've, I've just shared with many people, my own personal beekeeping friends, you got to come listen to Julia because she's going to talk about real drones going after drones. It's just such a fun, fun topic. And, um, you know, it's interesting when I heard the talk. Well, let me let me first do the, a brief introduction. Uh, Julia is a Georgia master beekeeper who has been keeping bees since 2004. We've actually watched uh, we're you know, we here in New Mexico, we feel we have a pretty strong beekeeping program and lots of beekeepers. But oh, my gosh, Georgia, you guys are just. Uh, clicking on all cylinders. Many, many local groups, a very, very strong uh, statewide group. And uh, and you're a big part of that. So we're glad to have you here. Um, you. Julia created a citizen science website, mapmydca.com. And everyone, most people know that a DCA is a drone congregation area where she gathers data on drones in her area. She was awarded the Georgia Beekeeper of the Year in 2008. And also, as a um, she's Julia is a phenomenal graphic artist, and she designed the Georgia Save the Honey Bee license plate. Interestingly, we have a not a Save the Honey Bee, but Protect Pollinators license plates here in New Mexico. So, cool. Well, you should and, get a Honey Bee plate. It's um, it's actually been an incredible income generator for the state club because we get. $22 off of every plate on the road every year that the plates on the road. So we're probably going to get close to 90 grand this year. Oh so my gosh. It's a that's game changer in terms of outreach and education. That's, yeah. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, crazy good. Yeah. Okay. So Julia is uh, passionate about education and teaches beekeeping in Georgia prisons and is active in her local and state beekeeping organization. So Julia, so happy to have you today. I mean, I'm personally very excited about your talk, even though I've seen it twice. I think it's so exciting to think about. I mean, I, I, I'm one of the, I think many beekeepers, I'm one of these beekeepers that likes to buy the latest gadget. And after, you know, watching your talk, it's going to maybe make me want to buy a drone, but I'm a little worried about my neighbors. I mean, they, they can accept the bees next door, but me as an amateur drone pilot flying the drone around near their house, I think I might get some uh, complaints from the homeowners association. Yeah, you, so you got, yeah, you got to be careful. But yeah. um, cool. Well, I'm excited to be here. We're ready to start. Let me share my screen. And hope that this works. Let me see. Stephen, looks good. Uh, okay, so you're not seeing yeah. uh, seeing the the uh, looks presenter. good. Looks right. good. All righty. So. I like to say that drones are the Rodney Dangerfields of the bee world. They get no respect. When you were a new beekeeper, what you probably were taught about drones is that they're, first of all, they're the male bees and that they only have one job and that's to mate with other queens. And you might've been told that they don't contribute in any discernible way to the survival of their colony and that you might've even been you know, told that they're sort of freeloaders and a drain on your colony's resources. However, if you dig a little deeper, I think you'll find that drones are fascinating. They're integral to the colony health. And I hope you'll better learn to appreciate these little fellas after my talk is over. So um, this is sort of the status of a, a, a robust colony in the spring at their peak, right? You have probably one queen, and we all know that often there are two, and maybe 60,000 workers at the peak. And at that point, you might have two to 6,000 drones. So there are a lot fewer drones in the colony than workers at all times. And this is my little lineup, just sort of sizing up the different types of bees in the colony. The queen is the um, tallest, um, and the worker, of course, is the shortest and weighs the less, but the drones weigh about 100 um, milligrams more than queens, but they're a little bit shorter and stockier. And here on the left, you see a picture of a drone compared to his sisters. And you can see how much bigger he is and how much bigger his eyes are. And drones typically live 22 to 32 days. So I think that to all the worker bees, they actually look like this guy on the right. They're always young and hot. So before I talk about drones specifically, I wanted to back up to some colony basics. So in order for a colony to survive, they have to be queen, right? They have to have a queen, right? And then they have to have lots of workers. 
and they have to have food stores in order to survive winter. So these are the bare minimum for survival of a single colony. But what about the colony as a superorganism? The superorganism, in case you're not familiar, is when they're individual organisms that have specialized behavior that together create one organism. And the honeybee superorganism is the colony. So if you think about humans, what we need to survive is food, shelter, and water as individuals. That's how individual survival. But as a species, we have to reproduce to ensure survival. In a similar way, in order for the colony, the superorganism to reproduce, they have to have drones um, from other colonies. So I've heard it uh, said that in the uh, superorganism theory, you know, the queen represents the ovaries, the workers are the uh, the brain because they make the decisions, the liver, the comb is the liver. And in, the, uh, in that theory, the drones are then called the flying testes of the superorganism. And I could have drawn that differently and I didn't, and you're welcome. So in order for bees to reproduce on the colony level that worker honeybees have to raise drones. They have a biological drive to raise these drones and to be drone right. Even though their queen's not gonna mate with their brothers, they want to spread their genetics. We well, don't know if they want, but they have evolved to, to have this drive to spread their genetics. So we often speak of colonies being queen right and how important it is to have a queen. Well, it's also important that they be drone right. But you always have to keep in mind that drones, that colonies aren't gonna raise drones if they can't afford them. So it's sort of a luxury to be able to be strong enough to raise drones because they are a drain on their resources. If they're struggling, if they're just kind of barely getting by, they're not gonna raise drones. They are, are, you know, they have their priorities straight. So really it's a sign of prosperity if the um, colony can raise drones. And if I can indulge in some anthropomorphizing, I like to think of it as the workers have trophy husbands, like maybe they're on the flowers boasting about how many drones they can raise because it is a sign of prosperity. So back to the general thinking about uh, that you hear that drones are a drain on the colony, resources for the, for the average beekeeper. There was a study done um, in Scotland that compared colonies that were given drone come freely at the beginning of the season and those that were restricted. And by the end of the season, this was a pretty long study, they found that um, the drone right colonies were actually a little bit larger and they made slightly more honey than the colonies that weren't. And also because beekeeping is never simple, I uh, saw another study done in Tom Seeley's lab that showed the opposite to be true. So you never know with bees, but we know that for species survival, uh, the drones, the colony needs its drones and they have a strong drive to raise drones. If they're, if they're thriving and they can support them, they will raise them. And you know this because if you don't give them any place to make drones, especially in the um, spring, they're going to raise drone you know, anywhere they can find in between the boxes, as I'm sure you all have seen. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about drone biology. So let's begin at the beginning. With drones, life begins in a proper cell. Drones are bigger and they need a bigger crib. So what happens is uh, every time a queen lays an egg, she first puts her head into the cell and she feels around with her front legs to see how big the cell is. Then she pulls her head out, turns around, inserts her abdomen and lays an egg. Now if she felt that the cell was small, about four and a half to five millimeters, she's gonna lay an egg that will become a female, which means that she releases an egg as it passes down over this uh, valve fold. Her spermatheca, which is her organ that has stored all the sperm that she needs, is gonna release a little sperm in order to fertilize that egg and then she's gonna deposit out the sting chamber into the cell. Now, if she felt with those front legs that the cell is larger, around six millimeters or bigger, the spermatheca doesn't release any sperm, the egg isn't fertilized and it becomes a drone. Now think for a second how fascinating it is that just by feeling in that cell, the queen's body knows not to release sperm from that little gland uh, when the egg's being deposited. It's just kind of mind blowing how bees work. And by the way, we know that this is how it works because researchers cut the front legs off of queens and found that when they did that, the queens sort of laid willy nilly worker drone brood. And I'm sure those poor queens, that's all I can say, must've been really harrowing for them all in the name of science. So drones come from an unfertilized egg. They don't have fathers and they only have one set of chromosomes. So this is true of all hymenoptera, bees and wasps. And they're called haploids. Haploids have one set of chromosomes. Workers and queens are diploid. They have two sets of chromosomes. 
And honeybees, they don't have a sex determinant chromosome like humans do. You know, we have XY, you know, uh, sex chromosomes, but they have, what they have is a complementary sex determiner locus, um, sex determiner gene, I'm sorry, at a sex determination locus. And on this gene, at this locus, there are alleles. Now diploid individuals, um, so a fertilized egg is gonna have two sex alleles, one from each parent. Now, when the, uh, so when the alleles are different, that's called heterozygous and they become a female. So those, those individuals in a colony will be queens or workers. They have two different sex alleles. So there's 145 different ones out there in nature. If they have two different ones, they become uh, females. If they only have one sex allele, so it's um, then that they become male. That's what the drones are, they're haploid. But there is such a thing as diploid drones and those uh, individuals are homozygous. So it has um, two identical alleles. So if a queen is flying or if a, frequently what this is a sign of is inbreeding. And we know that inbreeding is bad, not just in the Game of Thrones because you end up with Joffrey, but it's bad for bees because uh, they are not gonna be a healthy colony. So typically when that happens, either the, the, the poor uh, queen was just unlucky that she made it with drones that had her same sex alleles or um, she made it with her brothers. And the, you know, you've heard of this shotgun brood pattern and that's typically what you see. And a lot of times new beekeepers will say, I've got a shotgun brood pattern when what they're seeing is um, hygienic behavior, but this is what a true shotgun brood pattern looks like. And what the reason why you see this is because uh, diploid drones give off a unique odor. Um, there's a cuticular compound that smells that the, such that the workers can detect it. And what they do is they, un, they immediately eat that larvae. Nothing is wasted, it's protein. So they can smell it and they pluck them out and eat them. And, and it's good that they do that because um, diploid drones are smaller and we know that small drones are not as uh, fertile and uh, don't mate as well as um, bigger drones. And they are also actually infertile. And you'll never see diploid drones in your colony. The workers always pull them out, but that when they raise them in labs, and that's how we know that they are um, infertile. So when I do uh, talks to children's groups, I always tell them how gentle honeybees are and they don't want to sting you and that they're gentle vegetarians and that wasps are you know, aggressive meat eaters. But the truth is that Honeybees are gentle vegetarians when they're not cannibals, but we don't tell kids that because we don't want to scare them to death. Okay, so the drones you'll see in your hives, they're haploids, and because they only have one set of chromosomes, sometimes you'll be able to see recessive genes expressed. And in honeybees, the dominant eye color gene is black. So occasionally you'll see um, bees with different color eyes. This is a, a drone I found this summer with white eyes. And it's kind of interesting to see, but sad for him because they're blind. You also see these sort of beige, um, brown and cherry colored eye drones. And there's also a green eye drone that I've never um, had the pleasure of seeing before. But that's kind of one cool thing about drones. Okay, so we have haploid drone eggs in larger cells. And when you're first learning about bees, you're taught that all larvae are fed royal jelly for the first few days, right? So the truth is it's a little more complicated than that. Um, the actually three different type bees actually get three different jellies. And it's really just a different combination of the clear food and the, um, and the white food. But the biggest difference in drones and workers is that they get a lot more food. They're bigger bees and they need a lot more food, not unlike teenage humans. So it, just like workers at the end of their um, larval time, they are fed more bee bread and honey um, and less jelly, but they just get lots and lots more of it. And y'all are probably familiar with this type of chart where everyone is an egg for three days and then uh, the larval times change a little bit. Uh, drones are larvae for a couple more days and then they are pupae for a couple more days too than um, workers. But these times, these, these uh, yeah, times, these days are not set in stone. They, they are heavily dependent on two things. Um, temperature and food. So if they don't eat enough or if it's cooler, it's going to take them longer to pupate. And there's actually quite a range. So it can take from 20 to 28 days for a drone to emerge, 16 to 24 for workers, or 14 to 17 for um, queens. Um, now studies show consistently that 
the total um, survival rate of pupae of drones is, is much lower than it is for workers. And it probably has to do with the location of the drone cells in the nest. So we talked about how the drones are raised in larger cells. Well, how does this work? If bees make their own comb and they're not supplied with foundation from beekeepers, they're actually amazing little architects. They're gonna create smaller cells in the center of the nest where they'll raise their worker brood. And then the cells on the periphery of the nest get bigger and bigger and they'll lay the drone larvae on the edge of the worker nest and below. And then of course they have their pollen and, and honey up in the corners. Now, if you go back to the priorities of the colony for survival, uh, remember that first they have to be queen right, then they have to have workers, then in order to carry the jets, they need to raise drones. So drones are sort of third in priority and uh, for the colony for survival. So they end up being raised towards the outside and the bottom of the nest. And um, if you remember food and temperature, so is, is the, the factors in the survival and, um, and time, pupil times, um, who do you think is going to be warmer? Well, the workers are going to be warmer because the drones are sort of insulating them. If there's a cold snap, the drones are going to be the first to get a chill. And then what about food? Well, you know, sort of like sitting in the middle of a restaurant for, versus sitting out in the corner, who, who's going to get their, uh, their coffee filled up faster? It's going to be the workers, not the drones. So it's kind of interesting that even in their, um, in their larval and pupil stage, the drones serve the workers by the more important workers by providing insulation, which is really cool when you think about it. So in a hive where a beekeeper is using foundation, the bees have to get a little creative about where to raise their drones. And so they'll typically draw out comb in between the frames, as I sort of alluded to a little bit earlier. And, and we've all had this experience of pulling out a frame and especially in the spring and ripping open um, drone cells. Now they will, raised drones on foundation, you'll see they, they bump out farther, sort of like bubble wrap, but um, bigger drones are healthier and have higher sperm counts. So it's important to give them room to raise bigger drones and not, um, not force them to do it on foundation, a worker foundation. So here's some actual drone cells compared to worker cells, um, in case we have some new beekeepers on today. Um, drone brood looks like bubble wrap, basically. And you also see this is a foundationless frame um, that where the bees may comb the size that they wanted and how they raised their um, workers in the middle. So um, drone rearing um, usually happens during a nectar flow. And we all know that there's a big nectar flow in the spring. And there's also typically an, a, a smaller nectar flow in the fall. And there is um, going back um, many years in the research, they say that there's a, a second little smaller surge of drone rearing late in the season and early fall. And that's because of that fall nectar flow. So at any time, um, however, if the, if the nectar flow dries up or say you have a couple weeks of bad weather, um, as I mentioned earlier, their workers aren't going to raise drones if they can't afford them. So if the circumstances change, they will refuse entry to the um, colony of the drones. And they'll also start um, brood trimming. They start culling the, the brood. They'll uncap and pull out um, the larvae and pupae. And this is, a, this is an, something that work, workers do also with worker brood. And it's called brood trimming where they cannibalize eggs, larvae, and even kept pupae as changes in temperature and resources dictate. So um, workers trim the brood by, by eating it. And sometimes in a small colony, you know, we just when they're, excuse me, sometimes in a small colony, there aren't enough workers to raise all the eggs that a queen lays. Have you ever requeened and, you, you know, the colony's kind of struggling, you requeen, you got this booming new queen and she starts laying like mad and you come in the next, check and you're like, why isn't all this capped? Well, they don't have enough workers to care for those uh, larvae. So, um, so the workers just eat them. But even the, in, a, in a bigger colony, think about that. Like it kind of is mind boggling to think about the feedback mechanisms that have to be in place. How does one worker know what her sisters are doing? And how does she know it's okay to eat these eggs and pupae and not others? Which is, you know, there's so many intricacies in a hive that we just don't understand, but I find endlessly fascinating. So adult drones emerge fully formed and they have all the equipment they need to carry out their, um, their reproductive uh, goal in life, but they're still developing the first couple weeks after emergence and they're not quite ready to mate. So for the first 24 hours, their cuticles are hardening. They're just kind of walking around, getting the lay of the land. They can't fly or anything. Um, for the first week, 
they uh, they don't feed themselves. Actually, can feed themselves, but they just if, if workers are around nurse bees, they tend to stick to the brood area where nurse bees will feed them the regurgitated contents of their stomach, and then after that, they tend to move up into um, the honey supers, and they can drink and they drink directly from honey cells. And for the rest of their lives, that's all they do. They they eat honey. They don't eat pollen. Um, they just need carbs to fuel their flights. And for the first 12 days, their reproductive organs are maturing. So they have all the body parts they need when they emerge, but it takes almost two weeks for the sperm to move from the testes to the seminal vesicles. And at that point, the mature semen is available. Days six through nine, they take their orientation and cleansing flights. And then between days 12 and 18, they can start attempting mating flights, their first mating flights. So drones have one job and very few of the drones raised are gonna to get to complete their ultimate destiny. And that is to mate with queens from other colonies. So let's look next at how drones are equipped for their one job and how they differ from workers. So first, um, from, compared to workers, they are lacking in some ways. They have tiny mandibles and they don't need big mandibles. They're not chewing propolis off of trees and moving things around. So they just need to be able to uncap a cell. They have a short proboscis. They're about three millimeters compared to workers, which is six. And because all they have to do is sip honey out of the cell, they don't have to go out and mine flowers for nectar. They don't have pollen collecting structures on their legs. They have a slender crop. They don't have that complicated honey stomach that workers have. And they don't have wax hypopharyngeal or nasonoff glands. And what makes them really fun to play with is they do not have a sting gland. They don't have stingers, they can't sting you. And that's true of all, um, all hymenoptera. So let's look at how they are equipped to carry out their one job. Their antennae have 10 times the olfactory plates of workers. Let's just think about that for a second. We all know that, that workers have an incredible sense of smell. If you ever had a, something with a drop of honey on it out in the patio and you know how long it takes for your bees to show up, not very long. So they can tell smell 10 times better and they have to be able to do this because they have to smell the virgin queen's pheromones while they're out flying around. They have much larger compound eyes. They almost look like they touch in the middle. They have 8,600 facets versus 69. And the optic lobes of the brain are a lot larger than workers in order to process all that information that's coming in those eyes. And again, they need to be able to spot that queen while they're out flying. Their mandibles, though they be tiny, produce pheromones that are really important for homing while they're out flying in the drone congregation area. It lets other drones know that uh, you know, you've arrived and it also um, could be a signal to queens that they've arrived in the drone congregation area. And they have larger uh, flight muscles and broader wings in order to propel them, well, uh, broader wings in order to propel them because their, their main job is to fly as long as they can. Um, and then another interesting thing is that their thorax does create heat for brood. And this is um, something that you don't hear frequently. You always hear that they don't contribute in any way inside the nest, but they do generate heat from their thorax. And when they're younger, especially, and they're down on the brood um, frames, they do contribute to heating the nest. And um, I had read somewhere that they will, um, the workers can kind of signal to them, hey, turn on your engine, start warming things up, which is kind of cool that they help out a little bit. Okay, what do you see on this slide? This is a picture of bees mating in the sky and there's nothing on it because it is literally impossible to see with the naked eye. Honeybees are unique in their mating behavior in that they mate only on the wing or while they're flying. And because of this, it's been really difficult to study. Um, people in, like Aristotle used, wrote about bees and said, oh, you know, maybe they just don't mate at all. They, especially since the drones um, reproductive organs are all internal and you can't see them. They thought maybe they just sort of magically reproduced somehow chastely. But um, it wasn't until, I mean, people figured it out after uh, in the common era, but um, until they were able to attach kites to queens and film the mating flights, that's when um, people, researchers could really understand the mechanics of what was going on. 
So what happens is honeybees mate in areas called drone congregation areas or DCAs. And these are areas about 30 to 200 meters in diameter where drones from many different colonies gather and fly around looking for queens to mate with. And while they're flying around, um, as I just mentioned, the air is filling with the drone's mandibular pheromones, which helps them, them orient to these DCAs. Now, a drone from one colony will visit several different DCAs um, in, in a day. And from that colony, drones will be at different DCAs. And um, so, they, so it's sort of like bar hopping. They just kind of hop around from, from different um, DCAs. So at a, an individual DCA, you're not going to see all the drones from one colony is my point. You're going to see drones from many colonies from the surrounding area. Now drones can fly for about 30 minutes before they have to, they run out of fuel and they have to go back home and they uh, groom themselves, drink up more honey and head back out, head back out again. So that time sort of dependent on how hot it is and how far they're flying, but they fly for about 30 minutes and they leave the nest to go on mating flights in the afternoon usually from one to four or 12 to three, depending on which book you read. And then in warmer climates, like in the South, they, they actually fly later in the day. So um, from three to seven is when I see them flying. I'm in Georgia. So that's when um, I see them flying here. And uh, I know in Florida, they also fly later. There was a, a graduate student at Jamie Ellis's lab that I corresponded with, and she did some work on uh, making traps to find during congregation areas. And she said that because she was, you know, the books say 12 to 2, 1 to 3, she was um, looking so earlier in the day, she almost just gave up because she wasn't seeing any drones flying. It wasn't until she expanded her time that she found that they were flying later in the day. So this definitely has to do with your local climate. So the drone propagation areas are mysterious and they're mysterious because they remain the same year after year. There's a DCA and Sheffield, England has said to have bees in it since 1722. How crazy is that? So um, obviously if there are no colonies in the area, they're not gonna be populated, but somehow the bees know to go to the same areas. And because drones typically die out in winter, there's no intergenerational uh, learning. So, and we know that from observing bees in the colony that drones don't participate in any kind of communication dances or anything in the colony. So. How do they know where to go? And um, uh, there, there was another um, interesting study where they took uh, drones in a colony and they, they put dots of paint on them. And then they drove them 20 miles away overnight to an area where they had mapped out their drone congregation areas. And they, they released, the, they opened up the hive and they had people at the drone congregation areas swiping and monitoring. And they found that within 15 minutes, those drones had found the DCAs, which is crazy when you think about it. So they're mysterious. We don't really understand a lot about them because they're way up in the sky and they're flying um, um, 50 to 200 feet in the air. And it's kind of difficult, but there are some things that people have observed in DCAs that give us some clues about their, um, where they are. They tend to be depressions in landscape. So the bees, when they fly out of the colony, they're gonna look and they're gonna kind of head towards low spots as opposed to flying uphill. And there are visual cues that they, like a tree line or a river or a roadway that they fly along. Um, and some of the literature you'll read that they're, that they often, that there's an open area surrounded by a windbreak that it's hard to mate when it's super windy. They also tend to not really fly when it's super windy. They're kind of finicky, but um, but so a, uh, an open field lined by trees or a parking lot lined by building, tall buildings can provide a windbreak. And there's also a possibility that DCAs happen where there are magnetic anomalies in the earth. We know that all honeybees, um, workers and drones have iron particles in their abdomens. And we know that uh, workers will use this magnetic as part of their orientation to their colony. So this is definitely a possibility as well. So we call um, the pathways that drones use to travel to and from various DCAs flyways. And on the right is a map of DCAs and flyways in Arizona from a study done by Gerald Loper that where he used radar, which is pretty cool. Um, the dots are the DCAs and the lines are the flyways. And you can sort of see that they're, they're following this, um, this roadway. And you can also see how they, the DCAs often happen where, in like where, where a, uh, 
there's a branching of these visual cues. So drones, they fly around the DCAs and once they spot and smell a queen, they're gonna gather in a comet-like formation and chase the virgin queens. And the strongest, fastest drones reach her and mate while they're all in the air flying about 12 miles an hour, um, which is crazy. So uh, given the opportunity, bees are gonna mate in the flyways as well. That happens. And, but inbreeding, you know, is not good for honeybees. So the mating process has a few really interesting checks in place to discourage inbreeding. Um, when drones leave the hive, if, uh, if they're not otherwise encumbered by um, trees and growth, what they're gonna do is they're gonna fly up um, about 26 meters and then they're gonna head out. And then when they find the DCA, they're gonna fly up to 75 meters above the ground. So they're gonna be flying around in the drone congregation area. But workers and queens, they tend to stick, they tend to fly out and over about eight meters. So they're, they're flying at a lower height than queens, than, than drones, sorry. And the drones, because they only have 30 minutes to fly and they're probably not gonna mate, they tend to stick to drone congregation areas closer to home. I used to put a third of a mile on the drones and a mile for the queens, but it really has everything to do with colony density in the area. So the thing to keep in mind is just that drones stick closer to home and queens go farther away. Now there are gonna be hundreds, if not thousands of drones in a drone congregation area and a queen will mate with you know, upwards of 20 to 50 drones. So if she gets to a drone congregation area, she's gonna have plenty to choose from. So she can sort of afford to invest in a longer flight than the drones. So this, this whole setup has, has evolved to keep inbreeding um, down, which is fascinating, I think. Okay, honeybee copulation is a complicated thing. And I already, um, I mentioned that it's done mid-flight on the go. They're flying about 12 or 13 miles an hour. So a queen finds a DCA and because her strong pheromones she um, will, will quickly attract a comet of drones chasing her. So they'll, they'll sort of line up and they approach her from below. And once contact is made, it takes literally two seconds for mating to happen. So she- Hey, can... Ju Julia? Yes? <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but should we ask small children to leave the room? I'm kidding. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, just... I'm kidding. Don't cry me off. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about biology. It's, it is the birds and the bees. So yeah, okay, so here's your graphic to cover your eyes, children. Um, and this is a graphic from um, Mark Winston's biology book. So hopefully it's not too scandalous. But inside the drone's barrel-shaped abdomen, his endophallus is folded up inside. And in order to mate, he has to mount the queen. He'll grab her with his first two pairs of legs. And at this point, in order to be successful, the queen has to open her sting chamber. And not all drones who get this far are gonna be successful. I like to point out that bees figured out consent a long time before humans did. So she, <laughs> we don't know whether she, what the, that mechanism is, could, it's, it's kind of up for debate, but she opens her sting chamber, he releases his endophallus in it. This makes a loud popping noise that you can actually hear from the ground if you're lucky. Um, and this uh, snaps him backward, he, it paralyzes him instantly and his endophallus actually breaks off and he falls to the ground and dies. So he, once he fulfills his destiny, he is, he's a dead uh, bee and he is not gonna fly back to the hive. Um, so his endophallus actually stays in uh, the queen and that she will continue to mate because you know, it takes a couple seconds. The next bee in line will, will, will mate with her. And there's the, the endophallus is this complicated organ and it's got this little fibrant lobe that um, kind of sticks up and they think that that's what's used to pull out the previous drones endophallus. But um, so she mates, she usually can finish it in one mating trip, but uh, sometimes weather or wind or whatever gets in the way. So she sometimes makes two or, uh, two or three flights. Within a couple of days though, she's completely done. So about 70% of the time, the queen uh, will return to the nest with the, um, the bulb of the last endophallus protruding from her abdomen. We call this the mating sign. And notice that orange color that's really vivid to us. Well, with the, because bees can see an ultraviolet, it's super visit, vivid to them. So that might also be an evolutionary thing that shows the other drones, you know, this is where you're, this is where the goal is. So drones that don't get lucky and die from, will fly around for half an hour, 
and then come back, drink a bunch of honey and head out again. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, going to several DCAs in the afternoon. But if mating doesn't kill them, eventually the workers will. Um, as I mentioned, if resources are scarce, like during a dearth in the middle of the summer, they'll refuse them entrance. They might kick them out, but, um, but the ones that make it to the end, the ones that are raised in the fall, they are eventually going to be kicked out because uh, they're not going to overwinter in the colony. Now, there are, you know, there's always um, an experienced beekeeper when I give this talk, he goes, I've seen a few drones and yeah, you know, a few, sometimes there was a, a study done where they, they took 10 colonies and they monitored drone rearing all year. And at, in the winter, they actually killed the colonies and counted the bees. And they found that in 30% of the hives, there was just a few drones. So 70% of the time they're completely wiped out. And sometimes there are a few, I think they must tell good jokes. I don't know, but, um, but they, don't, they don't last forever. Now, because drones, they can't sting you, they, um, they're useful in, for a few ways, in, in a few ways. Um, if you're trepidatious about marking queens and who isn't, if you've never done it before, it's kind of like scary because you don't want to squeeze her to pieces. Um, marking drones is a great way to practice. And this is actually a good club activity, you know, get a bunch of drones and uh, if you can get young ones, they can't fly, it's even better. And you can practice holding them by their thorax, which is the key thing to not squeeze their little abdomens and mark them. And that's kind of fun. And then other things that drones are fun to do with them. Um, I don't know how many of you all, um, uh, saw this big release on World Bee Day. National Geographic released these beautiful photos of Angelina Jolie with bees all over. And if you're on social media, it, it unleashed all kinds of uh, copycats. This is my buddy, Bobby Tenpen. I love that caption, hold my beer. But if you use drones, you don't even have to have your beer held because they can't sting you. Now they do tickle and uh, it was kind of hard to keep a straight face. But um, even if you don't want to do something like this, Drones are fun for educational. You can let kids hold them uh, because they can't sting and it just makes them fun to work with. Now, I wanna encourage everyone to make room for drones. The colonies have this biological drive to be drone right and it's really important. And there's several ways you can make room for drones so that they don't have to raise drones and you can make room for healthy drones because they don't uh, have to raise them in small cells. So what you can do is um, they make this green uh, these green frames that are uh, plastic and they're embossed with drone size cells. And these are created for uh, drone culling, which is a mite control. And Tina was just talking about this. Um, but you can also just use them to raise drones. It's, it's good though, because then you know exactly where your drone comb is because it's bright green. And if you don't want to buy this equipment though, and it also, it does come in deeps and mediums, but you can also take a medium or shallow frame and put it in a deep box. And what they'll do is underneath, they'll draw out larger drone size cells and they'll raise the drones in there. Now, I know what everybody's thinking. You think about drones and you think about mites. So it's true because drones take longer to pupate. The founder's mite has longer, um, a longer time to, to make a couple extra mites. So more mites come out of a drone cell. And the, because Varroa evolved with Apis serrana, and Apis serrana, they don't, uh, they evolve together and they don't kill the bees and they only reproduce in drone brood in Apis serrana, as I understand. So there is some kind of uh, biological cue where they can smell the drone larvae and they're gonna jump in there first. And that's what makes drone brood trapping an effective mite control. But I wanna encourage you all, especially in the spring, uh, when mite loads are generally not a problem yet, to before you pull it out and freeze it or whatever, take your uncapping uh, scratcher and just you, you kind of rake it through like a comb and pull out a couple chunks of drone brood. And if they're not, if you're not seeing them full of mites, then let the bees have their, their drones. Um, I will say that the, the mite loads are much higher later in the summer than they are in the early spring. So and also, also, you should be monitoring your mites anyway. So if your mite loads aren't high, um, let your bees have their drones. They really uh, need that to be whole and your area needs drones for the bees to make with. So those are a couple ways to um, provide room for your bees to have their drones. And then I also wanna mention that uh, their studies show that neonicotinoid exposure makes drone sperm counts 39% lower. So pesticides are a big problem in beekeeping. 
Um, we tend to talk about the mites a lot, and I don't think we talk about the pesticides enough. So this is a big problem for drones as well as workers in Queens. Um, so I encourage every, every bee club to get involved with the, become a member of the Pollinator Stewardship Council because they're, it's an organization that is fighting pesticide use. So um, how do you find your drone congregation areas? Um, and for a long time, the way researchers found drone congregation areas is to get a weather balloon. And this is a weather balloon. It doesn't look that big, but it's actually four or five feet in diameter. And you fill it with helium. And you, this is a, a kite string here. And this is my buddy, Courtney, who's helped me this day. So this method takes two people because you have to have one person sort of flying the balloon like a kite and another person with binoculars looking for bees up here. And there's some uh, queen pheromone dangling from the balloon. And you, you, know, you kind of locate an area you think might be a DCA and you walk around with this and you uh, look, to look for bees. And you don't have to use the weather balloon. You can also use a, a tall pole, like a really, really tall pole and walk around with that. But the, uh, you know, both of these ways are very limiting. First of all, you, um, you're, you're only limited to the height that you can get. And also you're, you think about it, what you can't monitor an area over trees, you can only monitor open areas, right? So you're limited in that way too. And helium is uh, really expensive. There's actually a worldwide helium shortage. It's, it costs about a hundred bucks to fill up a balloon like that. Um, the first time I did it, I uh, filled it up and I went to these areas that look like textbook drone congregation areas. This is a soccer field surrounded by trees, right? Open area windbreak. It's a still day, hardly, hardly any clouds in the sky. And we didn't find a single insect flying around that uh, balloon. So, and then we went to a parking lot, you know, I kind of hit all the areas that I had looked on um, Google Maps to see that might be um, the fit the textbook as far as the landscape goes, I didn't find a single bee. So I thought, well, as long as there's helium in the balloon, I'll just keep walking around. And I went out the next morning and that balloon was dead on the ground. So helium doesn't last very long, so it's super expensive. And the pole can also be unwieldy, but you, you really, um, physically it's kind of challenging. I mean, you couldn't walk around carrying a, a pole like that for many hours. So um, I started thinking that there must be a better way. And so I ended up getting a, uh, mechanical drone to use. And this is just to save on confusion. When I say drone, I'm talking about these handsome fellas. And when I talk about the mechanical drone, I'm going to call it a UAV for unmanned aerial vehicle. So this is my drone and you can't see the thread. This is thread hanging down. And this is a, a heavy thing with uh, something that provides a little weight and um, lure. And for lure, so for the thread, the reason why you're using thread um, is because if your uh, lure gets caught on something on a tree branch or whatever, it's better that your thread snap and you lose your couple bucks in your lure than you crash your expensive UAV. So don't use fishing line or something strong. You want it to break if, um, if push comes to shove. And for lure, um, it's really hard to buy actual queen lure and it's expensive and you have to keep it in the freezer, but this product works great. It is um, called Temp Queen and it's got artificial queen mandibular pheromone, which is a sex attractant. Um, queen mandibular pheromone is not the thing that smells like lemongrass. So that is not gonna work for sex attractant. And this is a product that um, you can get from the bee supplier companies. They make it so that when you have a queenless colony and you need a week or so to um, like to order a new queen in the mail or something, it keeps, it suppresses the workers um, uh, ovaries from starting to produce. So you don't get laying workers. So that's what it's made for, um, but it works great for this. And it comes just like this with a couple of zip ties and you can buy it in bulk. It's a few dollars um, each if you get a get bulk and you can keep it in your freezer for years. Um, I have a whole freezer a drawer dedicated to my bee stuff. So, um, and you need something that has a little bit of weight to it to attach the lure to. And I found that these hair rollers work great because um, it lets a little air through and it provides just about the right um, amount of weight. You want it to weigh about seven to nine grams. I experimented with things that are bigger like um, those, those like shower scrunchy things that, you know, something that air can move through. And that I found that the great weight was about seven to nine grams. So you want to peel off the fuzzy outer, outer layer of the roller and then you can attach the um, queen pheromone and then this is just cheap uh, cotton sewing thread. 
I used some jewelry hardware to kind of attach the um, lure to the feet of my UAV, but you can just tie it on. It's not a big deal if you're not, um, if you don't want to go that much trouble. Now I have a user, Teresa Martin in um, Kentucky, and she didn't want to go buy us a thing of hair rollers she wasn't going to use. Can't really blame her. And she got a pill bottle and just drilled some holes in it and it works great. So that's probably a, a more feasible um, thing to do if you don't want to go out and buy some hair rollers you're not going to use all of. So when I first started doing this, I didn't want to artificially flood the area with the queen pheromone. So um, I lay down in my driveway and I flew my UAV up until I didn't feel the wind or the wash from the propellers on my face anymore. And that was at about 20 feet from my UAV. So I always try if I can to have my lure hanging down below 20 feet. So I make it like 22 or 24 feet of line. So just so I can be assured that I'm not like, you know, creating some artificial, uh, artificially charged area with queen pheromone. But I will say that even flying around in the same area for a while, I have not ever found um, bees unless it was just tons and tons of thousands of bees. And you find, if you're in a drone congregation area, you find it right away. So where are you gonna look for your DCAs? Um, I recommend that you use this Google Earth Pro, which used to be expensive and now it's free. And you can um, download the software and then you want to go to the preferences and there's a, a, a thing under train that says elevation exaggeration. And you bump that up to the maximum, which is three. And this is because what I found um, is that, as I mentioned earlier, they head for depressions in the landscape. And a lot of times the DCAs happen where there's sort of a drop off. I mean, I'm not talking huge, but you know, it could be 10 or 20 feet. But so if you use this tool and it show it, what it does is it exaggerates these drop offs. So if you're in a hilly area, it can show you um, where the drop off is. So you, you bump that up and then you go and Google Earth. I'm not going to um, play a video of how to do it, but you would then hover over your apiary and then sort of look out and then head out in a direction that you think a bee might go. If there's some if there is a tree line or a roadway or some, some kind of visual cue, and then notice where there's a depression. So that's a good place to start. Um, it can uh, feel a little bit like looking at a needle in a haystack. So I want you to keep in mind too that time of day can, can have something to do with it. So there's a DCA that I've been in many times, but if I show up too early, there's nothing there. So what I recommend you doing is maybe, you know, get on Google Earth Pro if you want, scout out a few things just by looking at Google Earth, I mean, uh, at Google Maps. Um, that's, that's also a very valid way to start. Look for some open areas um, going out from your apiary and then pick a few and then start in the afternoon. And maybe, like I said, they'll show up within five minutes. Go to one, fly around, go to another, fly around and another, and then circle back to the first one because the drones might be showing up a little bit later, okay? Now, um, these are bees flying around my uh, lure, uh, drones flying around my lure. And when I first saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I found a drone congregation area. It was over an apartment complex, but this is just a handful of drones. So tens of drones indicates a flyway. So that's sort of where the, the you know, the highway. Um, hundreds, if not thousands of drones, that's when you're in the DCA. So you'll, you will know when you see it. I'm gonna play this video and hope that it translates okay. Another good thing about having the long line is you can see, see all these little white specks around the lure. You see how many bees are down there, but you can also see the bees that are, that are flying in the whole area. Um, that you can see how they kind of line up behind each other. When I first started doing this, I thought I needed to move fast like a queen, but you really don't. You just need to, um, to just be in the area, but I hope you all can see all those little white specks. Um, and these videos are on the website. So I will show you how to find them. Um, so this is the website um, that um, Stephen mentioned earlier. It's mapmydca.com. And it is a citizen science project that um, I set up. I figured out how to do this with, um, with the uh, UAB. And because it's easy, once you kind of get set up, I just wanted to encourage other people to look for their DCAs. There's so little that we know about DCAs that having a database just has to be useful. So it's not a very specific goal that I have. I just wanted to have a place where there was a repository for this data and anyone doesn't cost anything to anybody. Um, anyone can download the data 
and anyone can upload data. So if you go to the, to the website, you can read uh, all about DRADS, about DCAs, about finding DCAs and the method that I've just been talking about. And then, so this is sort of one of the information pages. And then if you come back, um, you can click on view the DCA map or add a DCA to the map. But if you click on view the DCA map, you're gonna see um, a Google map where people have placed pens. And if you roll over one of the pens, this little uh, window pops up and it tells the name of the user and you don't have to put your name in, you could be anonymous. And then when you click on details, this pops up and it gives all the information that the user um, put in. So you can see I've been at this DCA many times. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit, there is a, um, a field YouTube video of this flight. So if you wanted to see some more videos of DCAs, I've uploaded a lot of videos. So if you wanna to go to the Atlanta area, you can um, view some of those videos, which is pretty cool to see. Um, I, what I don't address in this talk or on the website is how to responsibly be a UAV pilot. You really need to know what you're doing because um, this, it, it, they're cool and they're fun to fly, but they can be dangerous. If you were flying over a roadway and you crash into a car, you could cause an accident. So there are rules that you have to follow and places you have to register and all that stuff. Um, and uh, like Stephen was mentioned with his neighbors, you, you know, you also don't want to offend people. I flew over a, the apartment complex um, once and I wasn't, I was looking for bees. I wasn't really paying attention. And when I got home, I was looking at the video and I saw the people at the pool um, making nasty signs to me because they thought I was some creepo who was, you know, taking videos of people in bathing suits. But um, you, so you do want to know the, the law of your land. And I don't know what the laws are in New Mexico, but in Georgia, you don't have to, um, you can actually legally fly over private property so long as you are standing on public property. So I can stand in the roadway and fly over someone's home and it's not illegal, but it might sometimes be met with suspicion. So the story I like to tell is I was just like a mile from my house. I wasn't very far, I was in a cul-de-sac and I was flying um, over this cul-de-sac because it was a depression in the landscape. And I was getting ready to leave and this pickup truck pulls up and this guy um, is like, uh, what are you doing? Like there was no hellos, you know, clearly he wasn't happy. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing some honeybee research, believe it or not, but I don't want to make you uncomfortable. And I was just about to finish up. And he's like, what do you mean honeybee? You know, so I gave him a brief rundown of what I was doing. And as people will do, he says, well, I know a beekeeper. And I'm like, yeah, who do you, who's the beekeeper? You know, you never know, I might know him. And he's like, no, you don't know her. She doesn't live in Atlanta. She lives up and coming. She's a, uh, I know her from kayaking. And I said, oh, that must be Kelly Campbell. And he was like, oh yeah, that is Kelly. Okay, well, um, so by the time I left, he'd asked me to get my drone back up and take a picture of his house and send it to him. So we sort of became friends, but I'm driving home. Like I said, it was a short drive and I get this text from my friend Kelly with the screenshot. And it's got this conversation she has with this other guy where he says some bee lady was flying a drone over house today saying she was looking for male honeybees zooming over my treetops, WTF. She said she knew you, so I figured she had to be cool, so I didn't shoot her. So, you know, I live in Georgia, people love their guns, but you know, you all with all things, you know, we deal with stinging insects, so we're kind of used to being ambassadors, but um, you always wanna be friendly and uh, gracious. And the first thing you do if someone questions you is land your UAV, and then offer to leave because it's just not worth it. But um, that was, it did make for kind of a funny um, encounter. And then if you don't want to get a UAV, you might know someone who has one. People who have them love to have a reason to fly them. So maybe you can do this project with somebody that you know. You can also reach out to um, drone clubs in your area. I um, have heard the, the mentor that I got to teach me how to fly a UAV, told me that there have been many times when he encountered a whole bunch of bees and they weren't, you know, it wasn't a swarm, it was too high, it was a drone congregation area. And so they come across them and the, the YouTube is rife with videos of, you know, killer bees attacked my drone and they really just limited it to a DCA. So um, I've reached out to my local uh, drone organizations and said, you know, if any of your members is, uh, you know, runs into, you know, they get swarmed by mob by bees, please let me know when and where they were, because that could be a place and you can go back to that area and maybe not even fly UAV. The reason why drones are called drones is because 
when they're flying in mass, they, the hum is so strong that you can hear it. It's really cool to be in a very highly populated DCA because you can just hear that roar. So you might be able to just go out and listen. There are some um, DCAs posted on the map that, that a user in Egypt posted where he said that they don't have access to UAVs. They just do it by sound. That's how they find their DCAs, which is pretty cool. So, um, so there are other ways to, to look for your drone congregation areas and, and, um, and please share on the website. So that is pretty much the end of my talk. These are, I had a few references on there. If you're interested in looking up any of those papers, there they are. The website again is mapmydca.com. And this is my email if you have any questions that don't get answered today. And um, you can follow me on the social medias at mapmydca. So I am going to, if I can access the chat with, oh, I'm still sharing my screen. Well, let's see, Julia, we're gonna, we can help you with the questions. Okay. And um, you know what I was thinking as you were giving your talk, you know, I've heard it a couple of times and I just love your sense of humor. But I guess as a speaker, one of the issues about being on Zoom webinar is you can't hear the chuckles. I mean, I was chuckling at several of your most um, innuendo. <laughs> I just loved it. It's too funny. Well, so thank you. I, I, I hope you were chuckling and not shrieking in horror. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I was chuckling. I was giggling. And uh, we have 94 participants. And if we were sitting in our in-person auditorium in Albuquerque, you would have heard the giggling because that was really cute and adorable and we loved it. Thank you. So so you have a, we have a number of questions. Okay. Um, again, I have three, but I'm gonna say, <laughs> save mine till the end. Uh, Amy Owen is asking about the question about uh, the, uh, are inbred worker female bees removed as well? Because I think you talked about inbred drones. Okay, that's a great question. Let's think about it, okay? If they're inbred, they have two of the same sex allele and two of the same sex alleles always become males. They always become diploid males. So they would, you wouldn't have that, that the cue to become a female is two different sex alleles. So if you have the same okay. sex allele, that, that's what a diploid drone is, but good thinking. Great, great, thanks. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking, I've heard rumored that drones can land at any hive and get refueled for their mating flight, kind of like a truck stop break and fill up. Is that true? Um, what we do know is that drones are notorious for drifting. So, you know, whether or not they're stopping to refuel and end up at home, we don't know. But I've, I've heard anecdotally, I haven't read the study that, you know, they can drift up to five miles. I don't know. I think that seems a, little, a bit extreme, but we know that they're notorious drifters. I think one of the reasons why they're, uh, I think that they're notorious drifters too, is because their, their parent colony might be like freezing them out. Like we can't handle you. So they just go next door, but we know that they, they do drift a lot. And that is, um, that is a thing. And I'm actually working on a study this summer. We've been tagging drones at Georgia Tech with these tiny little RFID chips, and it's just two colonies. But um, one of the things I'm interested in seeing is how much drift there is between the two colonies. But yes, they are notorious drifters. Excellent. Uh, Tina, one of our speakers is today, or really a speaker, is asking, do drones seek places with trees and do they rest in the trees while waiting for a queen? Or do they continuously fly in the DCA? How long can they stay aloft? Um, they continuously fly in the DCA. They and um, they can fly. I think the longest uh, we haven't analyzed our data this summer, but what I've read is they the average flight is thirty minutes, but they've recorded flights up to to fifty minutes. Um, and I was just reading yesterday about a, a rural area where they were doing studies. Um, this is years ago, and they would do pollinator sweeps. So they would take nets and just sweep all the flowers and capture all the pollinators and they never once got a honeybee drone so um there's some pretty strong evidence that they don't the only thing i've ever heard is i did hear one person anecdotally tell me and she was in a very dry area and uh more desert like maybe where you are that she saw drones drinking water once out on in a watering area in an apiary but um, there's no evidence that they land and rest. They fly the whole way there and the whole way back. I mean, they're very driven. And when you 
when you catch drones in a DCA, they're buzzing like man, man, they in a in a trap. They want to get out. They want to get back up there. That's their sole purpose. So I don't I don't think there's any resting. I think they just go back, fuel up, and head back out again. But and that's what the um, that's what all the studies record as well. That's great. You know, all this provides new information for me. You know, or additional information in that I'm one of those guys that when I explain, or one of those beekeepers that when I explain the different roles of the workers and the drones. Until this point, I pretty much say, oh yeah, the men, they don't do anything except one thing. So thank you for making me just a little bit smarter. That's great. Uh, Robert Gaudreau has asked, re regarding when you talked about the special uh, frames just for drones, mm -hmm. is it important to put drone frames toward the center of the brood box? Um, typically, they're going to not raise drones right in the middle of the nest. They're going to be in the periphery. So I wouldn't put it on the last frame. I would save that for pollen and honey, but I would put it in the number two or three. And it doesn't really matter. They're going to take it wherever it is. I've also found, um, found that to be true. So it's not a huge deal. But you always, anytime you want bees to draw out comb to, you want to put it uh, in between two brood combs. So another thing I think I forgot to mention, I usually do, if you don't want to buy the drink grown, the green drone um, frames, you can just pop your foundation out of a, a full frame. And if you put it in between two drawn combs with brood on it, they will draw that out straight and not make it bulgy and they'll make uh, drone size um, cells as well. You just might want to mark on top that you did that so you'll know which one it is. Great, thank you. Uh, Kathy Gressel has a question. She starts off with fascinating talk, Julia. Do you find that drones, even though not the same drones, obviously, use the same DCAs year after year? Um, yeah, yes. I mean, the same D DCAs are the same DCAs are used year after year. That's the thing that make that makes it so fascinating is that why why is this? Why do they go to these same spots? And what I found using the UAV it, um, that I maybe didn't mention is that most of the, um, now Atlanta is called the city of trees. We have a lot of tree canopy, but most of the DCAs I've found have been over tree canopy, not in the open field. And that picture I showed with the helium balloon in the soccer field, the first DCA I found is actually just two lots over from that soccer field. And it is booming it's the one i can hear the roar in it's so well populated there's a there's a drop off across the street like a, a physical drop off so um what i think that we might find as more dcas are discovered with other methods is that the whole thing about the open area might not necessarily be true i, I can't say that because there's just not enough yet but I, what i found is a lot over tree canopy which is interesting okay great um Amy, Amy Owen asks, do you worry about UAVs damaging or killing queens in the DCA, or is that pretty unlikely? You know, um, I will tell you that some that the drones are attracted to the UAV. They're attracted to the motor, and I kind of see it as defensive acting behavior, which I find fascinating because we know that drones aren't defensive in the colony at all. And I've thought about how to study this. I've been talking to, um, to Keith Delpine about it, um, trying to figure out how you could. And it would make sense that while they're out, that they might have defensive behavior against birds or predators protecting their brothers and the queens because they actually fly up and they'll kind of throw themselves at the UAV. And there's often some chopped up bee parts in the propellers. I will admit that. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I would feel horrible, of course, if a queen got killed, but the queens the drones are flying at the drone, at the UAV. And the UAV, I mean, I'm moving super slowly. I'm not zooming around trying to be like a bee. I just, I basically just take it up and hover and then move slowly around. So, um, I, and the propellers create, you know, a wash away. They, they don't suck wind um, in. So I wouldn't think it'd be likely, I mean, the queen would have to be super unlucky. I, don't, I, I can't imagine the queen would fly at the UAV the way the drones are attracted to it. So I feel terrible that that happened, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a thing for sure that bees get chopped up in the propellers. <laughs> so be prepared. 
You know, I just uh, one question I wanted to ask you, and this is something that's been affecting me in my area relative to drone congregation areas, is that um, myself and an another couple of beekeepers in this area on the southeast side of Santa Fe, uh, when we lose a queen, either from supersedure or, or other reasons, and a, and a hive will raise a new queen, a virgin queen, many, many times, um, we actually never had a queen return from a mating flight. Uh, and so we can make new queens, but for some reason they don't return. And I, when you talked about the wind today and how that might affect uh, drone congregation areas, I mean, we live in a windy area, in a windy, in a windy state. And in the spring, the winds can be just, um, in, you know, incessant. And uh, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about why a certain area either might be devoid of drone congregation areas or... Any other reasons why we would have trouble getting our queens mated? Well, they, they have to have drone congregation areas because bees have to have drones. You know, they, they have to have drones to mate with. So, um, but that's really interesting. I, um, I've been keeping bees for 17 years now, and I am a big proponent of letting my hives requeen themselves. I, I typically do that. I let them requeen and I've had, I have really good luck and I do, I make late season splits um, for varroa control and those tend to be a little less reliable than if, when I do splits in the spring in terms of requeening. Um, I just did four and two requeen successfully. One had a drone layer and the fourth didn't requeen at all. So so that's about 50 to 75% success. So that's really, that's really interesting. The stuff about wind is, is anecdotal stuff that I've read, but um, in some of the older studies uh, that, that you will read, they do point out that drones won't fly or, and queens too. I mean, they're not gonna fly on a super windy day. They're gonna wait until calm days. And I found that they, they also, we had a 97 degree day uh, last week, and uh, I, when I downloaded the data from our study at Georgia Tech, there were only like five flights, and there would normally be like 500. So it, it was just too hot for them, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but so so I, I can't I can't really answer that with any any scientific. Um, it's okay. It's okay. But, that, but that's interesting, and it's it's yeah. a shame too. Yeah. Well, it's challenging. It just means that we we buy a lot of queens. I mean, I've already bought, I think, eight queens. I have a small apiary, and I've already bought eight queens this year. Eight you don't, queens. So y'all don't have any queen breeders in your, surely you don't have queen breeders in Santa Fe? Not not many. We have one down in Albuquerque, but we uh, bring them in from elsewhere. Hmm. Um, so I wanted to ask a question about the UAV. So I know these days UAVs, you can get a small UAV for $30, or you probably could spend $3,000 on a UAV. What is the approximate cost of the UAV that you're using? That's a great question. So the, the, the one I have in the pictures, it, it's a $1,400 UAV. It's quite expensive. Um, I also have one of the little minis, uh, the um, DJI minis that was, um, I think it was about $600. The, the key thing that you want to have is a camera that you can access from your controller. And with my, my mini, the controller is actually an app on my phone. So a smartphone app is fine, but what you want to be able to do is see what the camera sees in real time. That's, that's the sort of, you know, the threshold in terms of money. A couple, when I started this in 2019, I ordered a $50 drone from Amazon thinking, you know, I wonder like how, how basic of a drone do you need? And it had a camera, but you couldn't see it on the controller, but the first flight, I had my son with me and we flew it up and I, I put, pulled on the controls to come down and it just kept going and it went over my <laughs> house and we walked down the street and I heard it buzzing in the, in a shrub and thank goodness it didn't land on somebody's car. But, um, it, then I, you know, I like, then I always read the reviews. Well, it hadn't, it had enough stars, but the review said that it doesn't come calibrated. They don't give you the instructions to calibrate it. You have to go to this website and this website to figure out how to calibrate it. So, but what I, you know, it, it, I kind of common sense figured even with that short of a flight, you just have to have a controller. So there are some that you can get for, for three or $400 that will do the trick. Yeah. So the key is to have uh, uh, yeah. something to monitor while, while you're flying. Great. So let's see, before we have a couple more questions, but before that, I just wanted to say, I, I just think it's so wonderful how you have developed this ability and you're sharing it with everyone. I mean, some, some people would say like, 
oh, I do this, but I'm not, I'll show you the videos, but I'm not going to show you how I did it. And I just think it's so generous and wonderful that you share this with the community. Um, I just wonder, I wonder, um, so do you have any sense of how many people you've inspired to go out and do this on their own? Yeah, so I um, posted the website in December 2019. And then in 2020, I had all these speaking engagements booked to tell people about it. And then 2020 happened, which actually was great because of all these Zoom meetings. Because so I've spoken like all over the place. And, um, and that short video that I did for Western Apiculture was, um, was really widely watched. And I'm really grateful for that. So I have registered users on the website a lot from, from all different, every, you know, from different states in the US, from Canada, from uh, Italy, from um, New Zealand, you know, so lots of different places, but not that many people have actually penned DCAs yet. And so that sort of, um, I kind of got absorbed in this, this study that I'm doing at Georgia Tech this summer, but um, that's sort of my next hurdle is try to, you know, I think even for me, when I started doing this, um, I guess in the summer of 2019, that I was really frustrated. I flew it a lot before I found the first DCA. And then I found three DCAs in a week. So, you know, you, it's, it kind of takes a little bit of persistence. Um, so I only have one user in the US that's posted anything besides me and that's Teresa um, in Kentucky. And then there's a bunch of, and then I've, I've reached out to researchers just to get information. And there's a guy um, in New Zealand who posted all his, that he found from his research. So there's a few researchers around who have posted theirs, but I mean, and you know what, I, I kind of look at like the baseball field, like, you know, I'll build it. If they come great, people post them great. If not, nothing ventured, nothing gained, but I hope that it, it, at some point it would just be this body of um, data that, that with, especially with the evolution of Google maps and all the things that you, you can do just from looking at a Google map, right. We might be able yeah. to glean some kind of, information that'll help make help it make sense. Excellent. I hope we get um, one or two people here in our audience that decide That'd be to great. go in. Yeah. And I, I also, I thought that was a great idea to uh, contact a drone club. Maybe you don't have to buy a drone, just give a drone flyer another reason to go out with this drone. I mean, you're just hanging a little thread. You're not really jeopardizing the drone. That would be a great way to get started. Yeah, and if you have a, um, it, at some, at Georgia Tech, there's a, um, uh, a program for construction, uh, a master's in construction, and they have to have drone flying hours because they use those for building inspections and they just need hours. So if you have a university there that has a drone construction management, that's another place to reach out and ask people. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, let's see if we can get a couple more of these questions answered. Uh, Tina Sebastian wants to know, have you tried tying a ribbon around a queen or drone so you can see where they're flying? Or can you just... And then maybe I can combine that with an, another question that she has. She says she would like to buy an RFID that could be glued on a queen. Is that possible? And how much would it cost? Uh, yeah, it's possible. Um, it, the system that we're using at Georgia Tech costs about $4,000. And it only monitors the, when, the, when the bees come and go through a reader. So we're not, we're not far enough along to make anything that affordable that can, that can follow a bee and you know, trace it back. There was a paper that was um, published that I can put in the chat where they used radar, a, a, a more recent paper than Gerald Lopers years ago, where they used radar, they put these um, things on the drones and they mapped out drone congregation areas. And it was really interesting, but again, just like in Jerry Loper's thing where I showed the little map, it was Arizona where they don't have a lot of trees. And this area was in England where they don't have a lot of trees. So it was sort of open fields, but it was interesting data. So you can do that. And so the guy in um, England, they tried it with the Queens, but they, they have to glue these tall things on them. And the Queens didn't fare so well, it didn't work for, for them. And I have never done that. I've never tied ribbons on Queens or drones to see where they're going. But um, you'd have to really, I mean, I try to watch them, you know, as they go, even with binoculars, you just lose sight of them, but I, it would be <laughs> yeah. hard to follow them it would be, it would just be hard to follow, but yeah. yeah. Okay, um, an anonymous attendee has asked, uh, do different bees, i.e. Italian or Carney, fly at different levels going to and from DCA? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I know that that makes a difference in lots of things, so it probably does. Um, 
And there's definitely genetics in terms of drone raising. Like I have a couple colonies that have been rearing drones all summer and some that haven't. So, um, but I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, and then Jenny is asking, do Africanized drones fly longer than other drones? Ah, good question. They actually fly, um, they, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the actual numbers, but they fly a little farther. Oh, I can't remember. Somehow they manage to saturate DCAs more efficiently. That's the long and the short of it. But another interesting fact, and I haven't found the study, but somebody told me there was a study where they, um, they artificially inseminated half European, half uh, Africanized uh, scutellata semen and put it in Queens. And that instead of laying half scutellata and half European uh, bees, when they analyzed the DNA of the bees that they raised, that they were 90% scutellata. So there's some mechanism in the spermatheca where those scutellata sperm are coming out first, which is fascinating. Hmm. Okay, um, another Anonymous attendee is asking, is there any way to check the magnetic attraction in DCA areas? Yeah, so there's a device called a magnometer that um, can, so what, what Gerald Loper um, has postulated for years is that it's like an anomaly. So when the magnetism changes and there's, there are these devices that you can get to survey the land. And um, what he would like to do is figure out how to attach it to find a, a UAV that can support that weight and monitor the land. And so um, I was trying to find somebody who could do that on some of the DCAs that I found here, but um, I just haven't found anybody yet. But that's, that's the way you would do it. So it's just a little bit of a challenge. The equipment's expensive um, and then you have to find a way, you know, usually you would survey it just by walking on the ground, but some areas you can't, you can't do that way. So, um, so yeah, that's something that people are looking into. Great. All right, so, and one of the, the comments that we got was um, people were interested in the graphic images you produced. And uh, I actually answered the question. The, the question was, wow, these graphics are wonderful. Who did them for you? And I, sh and I did it. I know that these, this is your work and it really yeah. is quite charming and Thank very you. effective. Quite, and Thank very you. effective. I mean, I learned so much. I love that where you took the drone and you showed all the different uh, characteristics and how they popped up. I, I, I learned things to, I didn't know about. I try to keep napping to a minimum when I'm talking, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we filled up all of your available time and um, we're probably, you're probably gonna get some questions from our participants on your website. And uh, that'd be great. And I um, yeah. thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. And I, if I can answer anybody's questions or if you get a drone and you have, you know, I'm, I'm available and I would love to help you um, find your DCAs, but thanks for having me, y'all. Um, yeah. You're really generous to have me and have a yeah. rest of conference. It'll be great, you're, thanks. You're, and you're, you're a generous and wonderful beekeeper researcher. We're Thank such you. a pleasure having you here today. Thank you so much. Thank you.